Good evening. Welcome to the beginning of Lent, our Ash Wednesday service. Dear brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ, on this day the church begins a holy season of prayerful and penitential reflection. Our attention is especially directed to the holy sufferings and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. From ancient times, the season of Lent has been kept as a time of special devotion, self-denial, and humble repentance born of a faithful heart that dwells confidently on his word and draws from it life and hope. Let us pray that our dear Father in heaven, for the sake of his beloved Son and in the power of his Holy Spirit, might richly bless this Lenten tide for us so that we may come to Easter with glad hearts and keep the feast in sincerity and truth. Please stand. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from my guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open 
open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Please be seated. For over a thousand years, the church has been inaugurating the Lenten season with ashes. Lent is a time of reflection upon our sins and upon our helpless position before our Almighty God. And this application of ashes reminds us all the more strongly of the curse that was pronounced to Adam and Eve at the fall. For dust you are, to dust you shall return. And so as we receive these ashes on our own heads, we remember our sin inherited from Adam and Eve. We remember all the sins we ourselves have committed since. We remember that left to ourselves, we would certainly and rightly die for eternity. But most of all, we remember and reflect on the great love of our Lord Jesus Christ, who became a curse for us, who died for us, and who rose for us, lifting us out of the ash heap and placing us into eternal life. I welcome you forward to receive your ashes. You can line up at the rail and uh, either stand or kneel and uh, receive your ashes. You can come, for, come forward and, and receive your ashes here at the rail. Dan, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return.
Let us pray. O God, you desire not the death of sinners, but rather that they would turn from their wickedness and live. We implore you to have compassion on the frailty of our mortal nature, for we acknowledge that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. Mercifully pardon our sins, that we may obtain the promises you have laid up for those who are repentant. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the singing of our next hymn, 419.
Deliver me, O Lord my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. In you, O Lord, do I put my trust. Leave me not, O Lord my God. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. Deliver me, O Lord my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. Good evening. Our first reading for this evening is from Joel, second chapter, 12 through 19. Yet even now, declares the Lord, Return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will will not return and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants, let the bridegroom leave the room and the bride herb chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, Weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say say among the people, Where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. O Lord, have mercy on us. Our second reading is from 2 Corinthians 5th chapter. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God working together with him. Then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you. And in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in any way, in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry, but as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold. We live as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, a poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. O Lord, have mercy on us. Please rise for the reading of the gospel.
Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Jesus said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you that they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you that they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please be seated as we continue with our next. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be good and pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our text for today is Psalm 51 that we read earlier. A familiar psalm, or at least parts of it are familiar. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Something we say most Sundays. It's a psalm in which 
sinners have been finding comfort for thousands of years. It's comforting words, confessing sins, and trusting that God will forgive. But the circumstances surrounding the creation of the psalm, the writing of the psalm, are not exactly comforting. This is a psalm of repentance because it's the psalm that David wrote after the events of the story of David and Bathsheba. So maybe you've heard this story, not one that we tell in Sunday school very often, but let's refresh our memories. So David's army is out to war. The Israelites are out, uh, out fighting, but David himself has stayed behind. The king has stayed behind. All the men are out fighting, but David the king is home in his palace. And he goes out overlooking the city, and he sees a woman bathing on, on the roof. And he's attracted to her, and so he sends someone to find out about her. And it turns out that she's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Uriah, which is one of David's best soldiers, who was out fighting in the war. And instead of stopping right there, David sees an opportunity that her husband is gone fighting. And so he sends for her, has her brought before him, and sleeps with her. And so David commits this big sin. He commits adultery with another man's wife. He forces Bathsheba to have sex with him. It's a big, terrible sin, but sadly, the story doesn't end there. The sin does not end there. Because David, well, he knows that he's done wrong. He knows that he's sinned, but instead of admitting his sin, instead of confessing his sin, he tries to hold it in, to hold it down, to bury it inside and hide all the evidence. But sin is kind of like quicksand. The more you struggle in quicksand, the deeper you sink down into it. And with sin, the more you fight it and try to wrestle it down inside of you, the more you try to hide it and cover it up, the more you struggle, the deeper into sin you sink. David doesn't confess. He fights. He tries to cover his sins, wrestle them into hiding. But of course, things only get worse. So Bathsheba is pregnant with David's child. And he tries to cover it up by getting Uriah to come home and be with his wife. And when that doesn't work, David arranges to have Uriah killed. David sinned his big sin, but instead of confessing, he started fighting. And he fought himself deeper and deeper into the quicksand until he was up to here with it. And that happens to us, too, when we try to hold our sin inside. The more we try to hide it, the more lies we have to tell, the more secrets we have to keep, the more people end up getting hurt until our necks are up to it in trouble. That's what happened to David. But sometimes it doesn't happen quite that way. Sometimes you don't have to tell any lies. You aren't actually hurting anybody directly by the, with your sin. You sin, but then you get away with it. No one knows what you did. You know you did wrong, but who's going to find out? You're certainly not going to tell anybody. Better to just leave this one in the dark, to bury this sin, leave it behind, fight it down into hiding. I mean, it's not even that hard to wrestle down because it was just a little sin. But when you get away with it once, before long, sooner or later, Satan will come along, whispering in your ear, you did it once, so why not one more time? Just once more won't hurt. Besides, who's going to know? And so you end up doing it again and again and again. And you keep on burying it. You keep on hiding it until without even realizing it, without even realizing what you've done, you've sunk yourself so deep into your sins that you can't even see above the quicksand. The sand's over your eyes. It's over your head. It's suffocating you. You can't breathe, but it seems like it's too late. You've sunk yourself too far. You're in too deep, and there isn't any way out now. David had sunk deep into his sins, so deep that as we read the story, we think that there's got to be no way he's coming back from this. Yeah, he's in too deep. Can't get himself out. And that's true. He can't get himself out. The only way for David to get out was with some help. And so God sends help. God sends the prophet Nathan. And Nathan confronts David with his sin. He drags that buried sin out of the darkness and into the light. He exposes the sin. 
The hiding's all over. And Nathan finally drags a confession out of David's mouth. David cries out, I have sinned against the Lord. But as soon as David confesses, as soon as he stops fighting and starts confessing, Nathan proclaims God's grace to him. The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. And so David, after all he'd done, after all that had happened, after all this, he writes the words of this psalm. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your abundant mercy, your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. David, the murderer, the adulterer, the assaulter, confesses his sin, brings it into the light, lays it out before God, and God, who does not despise a broken and contrite heart, forgives the iniquity of his sin. And that's one great thing about being here in the church, here amongst other Christians, why it's so important and so essential, because sometimes we get caught in our sins. Sometimes we've started to sink down into our sins, and we struggled and lied and tried to convince ourselves that we're fine, even though we're up to our necks in our sin. And what a blessing it is to have brothers and sisters in Christ there to pull us out, to call us to repentance, to be a Nathan for us, to drag our sins into the light so that we can stop fighting and start confessing. Because fighting only sinks you deeper. Only by confessing, by bringing your sins into the light, only by crying out to help, for uh, for help to Jesus, only by praying, create in me a clean heart, O God, will you ever be saved from the mire and the muck of your sin. But what about the times when there is no one there to call us out? We've been too careful. We've been crafty, and we've hidden our secret sins really well. No one even suspects. But behind our our facade, we have sunk low. We've struggled so much in the quicksand of our sins that we can't see, we can't hear, we can't breathe, and we're being suffocated by the quicksand of our sins. What then? after so many sins that we fought against for so long so that we're completely sunk, what help is there for us then? Anyone remember the movie The Princess Bride? There's that scene in the fire swamp. There's the flames and the giant rats and the quicksand. Buttercup and Wesley are walking along and all of a sudden... Buttercup's gone. She's plunged down into the quicksand, nowhere to be seen. And so Wesley grabs a vine, dives down into the sand and into the suffocating darkness and pulls her out. And that's what Jesus does for us. Jesus came down into this dark world. Jesus went into the heart of our sins and darkness on the cross. Jesus dives down into the blackness of your sins, the blackness of death, and pulls you out. He did it in your baptism when you were pulled out of the waters of death and into the waters of life. He continues to do it every time we fall into sin. Whenever we plunge ourselves into sin, we confess and Jesus pulls us out. We confess our transgressions to the Lord and he forgives the iniquity of our sin. We say, I have sinned against the Lord. And God says, I have taken away your sin. You are not going to die. You will not die, but you will live, because Christ has risen from the dead. Jesus has risen, and we shall arise. Give God the glory. Because Jesus has risen from the dead, Jesus has risen from the ashes of death, he also will raise us out of those ashes. Fighting against your sins and guilt, burying them and hiding them away, fighting only sinks you deeper into trouble, only by confessing bringing your sins into the light, by crying out to help for Jesus, 
to Jesus, create in me a clean heart, O God. Only then will we be saved from the mire of our sins. Because when we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins. God, who sees all of our sins, but God, who a broken and contrite heart, he will not despise. And that's what we're doing here today. We put ashes on our foreheads because we're bringing our sins into the light. We are acknowledging our sin. We're walking around with dust on our heads. Hey, everyone, I'm a sinner. Hey, God, I'm a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And because of your confession, the one whose mark you wear on your brow, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross, who dove into the dust and ashes of death, he dives deep down into the depths of our sins, of your sins, and pulls you out again. No matter how deep you've sunk or how long you've been down, Jesus comes to the worst sinners and offers forgiveness. The worst of sinners, even David, even Paul, even you or me. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord our God, King of all creation. For you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Grant us your spirit, gracious Father, that we may give heed to the testament of your Son in true faith, and above all, firmly take to heart the words with which Christ gives us his body and blood for our forgiveness. 
by your grace, lead us to remember and give thanks for the boundless love which he manifested to us by pouring out his precious blood. He saved us from your righteous wrath and from sin, death, and hell. Grant that we may receive the bread and wine that is his body and blood as a gift, a guarantee, and a pledge of his salvation. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and at his command, with his own words, we receive his testament. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Welcome to the Lord's table. You can come up and kneel or stand at the, at the rail.
Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the holy supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may, together with all the saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We close with our final hymn, To Thee, Omniscient Lord of All, on page 613. God's peace.